everybody and welcome my name's Ghost Critic and this is a, another new segment to my channel that I'll be doing periodically over the coming months called The Main Event. Now DC and Marvel have always been known for their kind of big blockbuster storylines. Um, if we go way, way, way back, these kind of events were they were truly an event. They happened rarely, to be fair. Uh, everyone had their own universes and they played around all by themselves doing all their own superheroic stuff. Um, and then things like Contest of Champions and uh, Secret Wars came along, the big event um, that crossed over lots of different um, books. Um, they crossed over different characters that would normally meet. They teamed up and this started a ball rolling and DC and Marvel both got in the game of bringing out um, eventually, you know, first it was very sporadically, then it was every year, then it seems to be every other month a big huge event comes along and has brought along the phrase event fatigue because no sooner has one ended that is meant to be all universe changing then another one crops up that deals with something entirely different and we forget about what the last event and there is no progression. Now what I'm going to do with this video section is go back and have a look at some of those events. Now it may be those big huge summer blockbusters that we get year in year out or I might look at some of the smaller uh, events that take place in just maybe uh, a character or a team's franchise like um, say Batman with War Games or uh, Spider-Man with Spider Island, something a little bit smaller um, that doesn't kind of over encompass um, like a, a mini series with lots of offshoots. What I will do in this uh, in these segments is I will only be focusing on if it's a big blockbuster book that kind of mini series. So it might be you know six or seven issues long, the main storyline. Because these days there are so many offshoots, um, spin-off titles that kind of slightly feed into the main storyline. But I'm only going to focus on that main storyline. Obviously, because I'm going to be talking about these events, I'm going to be talking about storylines, plot points, so there's going to be spoilers, people. I mean, some of these books that I'm picking out, they are, there's some that are like decade, there's a decade old one. Today's is over a decade. Um, so if you've not read it by now, I can't not just save a, a plot point or a story because you haven't read it so if you haven't seen Identity Crisis I haven't read it I should say uh, then please stop this video go read it come back and then watch or if you're not bothered about spoilers carry on So my first video is going to be on the book Identity Crisis. Wow, does DC love a crisis. If we look back at their years in uh, the comic book publishing game, we get them crisis on multiple Earths. We get a crisis on infinite Earths. We get a countdown to a final crisis that led to a final crisis that led to an infinite crisis. There are a lot of crises going on. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about Identity Crisis uh, this video. Uh, back in June 2004, Brad Meltzer and Rag Morales created um, a seven issue mini series that took a dark turn in the Justice League history. Um, 
as with most events like this, you get a lot of mixed reactions and Identity Crisis wasn't without its controversy. Uh, we had those people saying what a great kind of murder mystery story this was. Um, while there was the, the naysayers um, who weren't happy about the kind of insertion of the dark and sexual elements that were portrayed in this book. Um, to the point where I think it was uh, someone on Comic Alliance, I think it was Chris Sims, who said that basically Identity Crisis was everything wrong with modern comics. Oh, quite the put down. Um, uh, as concepts go, there was a lot of being dealt with in this series. Um, obviously death, uh, morality, identity clearly, breakdowns of relationships, they dealt with a lot of things. Whether they did it well or not in that seven issue series, it's up to you as the reader. Um, <clears throat> given that this was hyped as a murder mystery story, you knew someone was going to die. And personally for me, for someone who's read comics for a while, you kind of go through or decide to go down two paths depending on who that person is that's going to die. Uh, if it's like a big character name, if it's like a, a, an A-lister character, uh, you, there's less of an impact because guess what? They're not going to get rid of Batman, they're not going to get rid of Superman, they're not going to kill off Wonder Woman. Even if they try, you know they're going to come back in however ridiculous manner. If it's a supporting character, there is also that kind of double-edged sword where it's like, who cares? It's a supporting character. Uh, they're there to push along the story. They become a plot device for those bigger characters to bounce off of and uh, become that next point in their history, in their character, their evolution. So it's always difficult coming into a story like that to just take it, so to speak. Right, let's kick this off. We have issue one of Identity Crisis called Coffin. Um, it kicks off with uh, Ralph Dibney and Firehawk on top of a building on a stakeout. Um, we've got the villain Bolt doing some deal with some um, shady looking characters in an alleyway for a what may or may not be a um, kind of costume, weaponry. Uh, we only find out very quickly um, in, the, in the middle of this book. Um, but the, the, the idea of the start of this is of this book is very much a foreshadowing of what's going to happen at the end of the book uh, as uh, Ralph and Firehawk talk about how he met his wife Sue and it's all very idealised, it's very romantic, it's very sweet. We, we see how people look up to those two as kind of like the perfect loving couple. They, they never strayed from each other. And while Ralph is telling this story, we um, kind of pop in on, on two different um, kind of characters. We, we see Sue preparing Ralph's surprise birthday. And I say surprise like that because she does this every year and Ralph being a, a very clever detective always realises what she's up to. But this time Sue's got a little tiny secret that he doesn't know about and she knows she's going to catch him out this year. And also offsetting this kind of idyllic look at, at marriage, this kind of rosy white picket fence look at the, um, the, uh, the perfect marriage, we see Atom. Uh, and Jean Loring who have separated. Atom is just here to pick up um, some of his stuff he's left behind, sign some papers, pick up old costumes of his uh, with the kind of shrinking, shrinking devices on, on those costumes. Um, and so we already have this set up that you know we have this idyllic 
relationship, we have the breakdown of a relationship, but above all we know something bad is going to happen. It, it's a trope that's used not just in comic books, it's in TV, it's in films. You know when everything looks fine and everything looks content that something bad is going to happen to those characters. We get the early setup of uh, one of the villains that goes throughout this book and that's Calculator. He used to be very much a kind of C-lister, goofy type of character. He had this literally a big kind of calculator on his chest. But he's, he's upgraded in, in these years and he's basically become what is a villainous uh, version of Oracle. He deals in information. Um, he has his kind of hideout, all his TV screens, his computers, but he sells the information onto his fellow villains for money. So they kind of have the upper hand. Um, he deals out jobs for them, um, for like robbing banks, taking down heroes and the like. Um, and, and it's him that's uh, got Bolt this job. Uh, but it all goes pear-shaped, um, where Bolt eventually gets uh, mortally wounded. And again, this is juxtapo juxtaposed between uh, Jean's attack. While she's at home sorting out this party, she is murdered. She is the person who's going to get murdered, are supporting a character. Um, and it's from here on that the story moves very, very quickly. Brad Meltzer um, really does move the action along um, from the this first attack, this vicious attack on... Um, on Sue to Ralph's attempt to get there in time to save his wife, to him finding out that she was pregnant, to the investigation of the crime scene by all our kind of top tier DC hero detectives. And then we get to that funeral, which is, it has to be said, incredibly moving. Um, you know, you don't want to say this is a great shot because it's a funeral, but it did turn out to be very much the kind of who's who of DC superheroes. You know, they, there's not many um, characters within the DC universe that isn't here or you're not going to find in, in this double page spread. And it's done very, very well. Um, the emotional um, bias to this is kind of revved up to the max uh, and you really kind of do feel for Ralph in in this scene and as everyone disperses all the kind of superhero teams go off to do their things to find out who the killer is for some reason some leaguers stay behind uh, we've got the Hawkman, we've got Atom, we've got Black Canary, Zatanna, Green Arrow. Uh, they've all, for some reason, stayed behind. And it looks like they're there to help uh, and give support to Ralph. Um, but there is something underneath this that we're not quite sure about. And it's kind of revealed at the end of this issue that they've come to the conclusion the only person that could have done this was Dr. Light. So how was it that our leaguers came to the conclusion all of a sudden that our main culprit had to be Dr. Light? Well in issue two called The House of Lies we find out and it is a very dark episode in a Justice League history. A, a moment um, in their lives that has hitherto never been mentioned before and I think this is what upset a lot of readers and fans of the Justice League in general. Um, what we have is we, we had these characters all at the end of the funeral and they're kind of skirting around the conversation and it it isn't until they realise that they're being spied on uh, by fellow leaguers, no less. Um, talk about trust issues here. Uh, they realise that Kyle Rayner, one of the Green Lanterns, and Wally West, who is our current uh, Flash, uh, have been listening into them. And they have to explain 
why they have come to this conclusion that Dr. Light is to blame. And we find out uh, in a moment in Justice League history, uh, Sue Dibney decides she wants to um, spend a night at the Justice League HQ satellite and just basically do a bit of stargazing, look down on the Earth from outer space. And as uh, the Justice League are called away to avert some tragedy, take down some villain that the whole, only the whole team can do, she's left there all alone. And we see Dr. Light sneaking into the headquarters. And he's there actually only to retrieve a, one of his weapons, one of his light guns. But seeing Sue there, well what do you do? You basically attack her and that attack ends in the um, the rape of Sue Dibney. Again, it's another moment that readers were, were very worried about. They didn't like the direction that this was going in um, and in, in some respects it's, it's not the greatest of ways to tell a story. I think it's because it came so much out of the blue. It wasn't uh, a topic that DC had really um, used or even mentioned um, for, for, for a long time, if, 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 if ever. Um, so I think that's why it was so shocking a moment um, that had, like I said, never been mentioned before. Um, while in the middle of this attack, this rape, the Justice League come back um, and they manage to subdue Dr. Light and as Ralph takes Sue off to the hospital. Um, this is where, again, the morality, the morals of these kind of second string of Justice League uh, members kind of get a bit iffy and grey. Um, it starts not innocently enough, but Zaytana takes away that memory, that particular memory of uh, the event that just happened from Dr. Light's memory using her kind of backward magic. Um, but then they have this discussion about what is essentially lobotomizing Dr. Light, taking that part of his brain that makes him so evil, so... Uh, psychotic and you you kind of have to put yourself uh, in some respects in their shoes if you had that power if you were um, even a, as a medical procedure if you could remove that so-called evil gene out of someone's brain uh, to stop them from raping murdering killing um, kidnapping would you do it and eventually the majority take, decide that yes, we will do this to Dr. Light. We will take what is basically his personality, as evil and as bad as it may be, uh, and this take that away. Uh, and this is kind of the explanation that is used as why Dr. Light suddenly back then became such what is such a, a kind of goofy character uh, and not as kind of malicious and, and evil as he used to be. Uh, while that's all going on, we get the aside um, of the villains in their own uh, satellite headquarters, looking a little less um, luxurious, let's say, than the Justice League's headquarters. Uh, but the talk obviously is all about Dr. Light um, and what is happening and who should turn up but Dr. Light, he's looking for protection. He knows he's being um, placed, the blame has been placed on him and he's willing to pay anyone uh, to protect him from the Justice League and it is down to a death stroke um, who steps up to be basically his bodyguard. And, and, as, and as they're kind of the Justice League are out looking for um, Dr. Light uh, to, to bring him in, to take him down. We kind of get this intercut scene of Dr. Midnight who is doing an autopsy on Sue Dibney's body. Uh, and he comes to the conclusion uh, that 
basically it couldn't have been Dr. Light who killed Sue. But of course, that bit of information is not going to get to our team in time. In issue three, Serial Killer, we finally get that obligatory fight scene, that big punch up between the villain and our superheroes as Justice League take on Deathstroke. Unbeknownst to them that this is, the, the irony of this is that um, Dr. Light is not the killer of Sue Dibney. But let's have a big fight scene everybody and Deathstroke as always is prepared with all his gadgets all his weapons and uh, attempts to take down uh, some of the members of Justice League to give himself a fighting chance but numbers eventually overwhelm him and he is taken down now two things kind of come out of this um, the first thing is Something that stuck out to me, um, and that was throughout this fight scene, we have Green Arrow and his kind of inner monologue going on. And it's his analogy to um, what his team is all about. Um, he mentions the way that Justice Society of America uh, teach you how to be a hero, how the Titans teach you how to be a family. Well, the Justice League teach you how to fight. And I think this kind of degrades the Justice League in some respects. Um, he is basically comparing them just to a hammer. They are there to knock things out. They are that blunt instrument. Um, they're not, they don't have the, I want to say intelligence and uh, to find another way to resolve a problem. And that's just not what the Justice League um, are always all about. Um, so that kind of stuck in my mind um, a great deal and didn't really fit the character of Justice League that we've, we've known and read about previously. The other plot point that comes out of this fight is that Dr. Light remembers he remembers it all as we have all our kind of superheroes at the top here clambering on to um, a death stroke dr light makes the um, the comparison of how they all attacked and piled onto him and of course that brings in a flood of memories his um his power goes crazy and we get this big flash of white light you probably can't quite see but his face is in there and he he escapes but with his now mind fully intact as we found out in in the previous where this all came out uh, zaytana wasn't very good at this um this was um this was her first time of doing it so you know precision probably wasn't her her best tool at the time so with the fight all done superman turns up wants to know what's going on they just deliver the story that's happened but this is another bit that probably annoyed a lot of people that uh, didn't seem in character particularly about Superman as while he turns up Flash, Green Arrow are having this conversation just to the side. We find out that this isn't the first time that Zaytana and this, this kind of group of leaguers have mind wiped villains before to protect their identities. Um, in, in fights when, when the villains have found out not just who they are but who their family are, who their lovers are um, and Superman is right there he's like no more than 10 feet away he's got super hearing people he must be able to hear this conversation and so we get another kind of grey area um, and especially using Superman um, he becomes get kind of complicit in this secret now. He, he must know that this has happened and he's doing nothing about it, which is very out of character for Superman. Um, Bruce Wayne, Batman, is always calling Superman, you know, the Boy Scout. He always does the right thing. There is no grey area with Superman. It's always black or white. 
Um, he takes down a villain, he puts them in prison, or he locks them in the negative zone, whatever. If they escape, he takes them down again. He will never kill. He will never do what the League have done to Dr. Light. But by hearing that conversation, which he must have done, does he become complicit in the overall secret? It's a very, very strange and grey area. Um, as the story progresses, uh, and to move this story along, uh, Captain Boomerang, another very C-list uh, uh, villain in, in kind of the rogues gallery of, of our Justice League heroes, uh, is kind of shoehorned in. Uh, we have um, this concept of Captain Boomerang has a son, which is revealed through some tabloid news story. Um, that's briefly um, used within within this issue, um, and it finishes with our cliffhanger of the next murder, uh, and that is of Jean Loring, the Atom's estranged ex-wife, as we see her hanging from the door, seemingly dead. In issue four. Who benefits? Atom, we see, fine, just manages to save Jean uh, from uh, being hanged on the back of her door. And despite their breakup that we saw right at the beginning of this uh, mini series, there is this moment, this kind of very sweet moment of how they used to be. This, there is a loving relationship uh, there. And once again, crime scene, looked over, nothing can be found. Who could this killer possibly be? The only clue that they have is the knot that was used in the hanging of uh, Jean. And um, that can only have been used by one person, because no one knows how to do this knot. It's Slipknot, but he's in prison um, using Wonder Woman's uh, lasso of truth. They don't get any further with um, trying to find out who the killer could possibly have been. Um, so we visit the supervillain community and it's them that kind of brings something to light in this story that as yet the leaguers haven't come to the conclusion of yet. And... The title of the story, Who Benefits, says it all. It's this, what is happening is bad for all the villains. Um, they are, they're deciding, we're going to keep our heads down. We don't want to get involved in this at all. Um, because whoever's doing this, they must be doing it for a reason. But, but how does it benefit them? It's not good for anyone. We see Captain Boomerang, he gets reunited with his son, who is actually surprisingly cool with the fact that his father has left him uh, through most of his childhood and early adult life. Um, and then we finally, thank God Batman's around, ask that question, who is going to benefit from this? Nothing is good has come from the fact that Jean is, that, sorry, that Sue is dead, that Jean could have potentially been dead. There is no benefit to whoever's doing this for killing these two. If anything, the killing on the attempted murder um, that have happened have actually brought the superheroes closer to their own families, made them more aware, more alert. So something doesn't quite add up here. And of course, next on the line, next on the list of potential um, attempted murders is that of Lois as she gets an anonymous letter letting her know that we know who your husband is. Now in issue five, Father's Day, we have... I mean, throughout the whole of this, we've had this concept of family. Um, the Whoever our villain is, is attacking close family members of uh, the Justice League. And we've had snippets of Tim Drake and his father um, in past issues where the father is trying to reconcile his um, worry uh, of his son being the, the latest Robin, just finding out, not wanting him to go out, especially at a time like this, uh, but knowing that it doesn't matter what he says, 
Tim's going to go out there as Robin uh, and help his fellow superheroes to, to find and bring down this villain. And in this issue, it definitely all comes to a head. Now, we have all the superheroes going out to look for this for this killer. We, we get snippets of the Titans, the Outsiders, the Justice Society of America, the reserve team of the Justice League. They're all looking and trying to basically, you know, get as much information as they can in any way they can um, to, to, to find out who the killer is. Uh, while that's all going on, Ray Palmer, our Atom and Gene are basically rekindling their relationship and Captain Boomerang and his son are reconnecting as um, Captain Boomerang kind of teaches his son how to use his, his weaponized boomerangs. But this is, the majority of this is all about Tim and Jack Drake. Uh, the trope, again, it's kind of obvious. They have a big argument. Tim goes out with Batman to help him take down and find the killer. And who's knocking at the door but Boomerang come to kill his father. And while Jack might take Boomerang with him, a boomerang to the heart, you're not going to come back from. Um, it doesn't matter how fast Batman flies that plane, that car, he's not going to get back in time. Again, it's another very kind of emotional roller coaster of an issue. Uh, I guess not only for Tim, but also for uh, Captain Boomerang's son as well. Um, as he finds out that Boomerang has been given this job by calculator uh, because basically he needs the money, he, he's taking any job just to, to get by at this point um, and there is this kind of very stark scene of, um, kind of Tim and Captain Boomerang's son, you know, screaming, Da, father, uh, at the same time just as both of them have died, one from a gunshot and the next from a boomerang to the heart. Now issue six, Husbands and Wives, was the main po problematic issue for me in the, the storytelling concept here and how quickly all the people assumed that Captain Boomerang must have been behind all these murders. Uh, because they all go back to their lives. They, they start, yes, they start spending more time with their loved ones, but they just seem to think this is all over. Um, Captain Boomerang's dead, there's going to be no more murders, and he must have been at the bottom of it all. And I find that very hard to believe, given how down on his luck Boomerang has been at the time. And for him to be that kind of C-list villain that really didn't have the chops and the... Um, the cleverness, the intelligence really to set up these murders for our top hero detectives not to know um, who actually did it to be basically fooled by Boomerang. I find that incredibly hard to believe so thank God again for Batman. Um, he doesn't believe this for a second and is off to find out uh, who the real killer is. And it is at this moment that another big reveal comes along that it's not only villains that Zaytana has been wiping the minds of, but it's been our fellow heroes too. Not least Batman himself, who was actually at the time there when Sue Dibney was raped and would certainly not have approved of this kind of lobotomization of Dr. Light, but that night was removed from his brain too. Um, the, this is the build-up. This is the penultimate issue. So we've got to get somewhere. We've got to have that little clue that spurs us on to, to the finale. And that comes with Dr. Midnight and Mr. Terrific, who are still doing an autopsy on Sue's um, body. And thank God that they finally found the clue to the killer, where they find two tiny little footprints on Sue's brain. Now how could they possibly have got there? Cut to Ray and Sue, sorry, Ray and Jean 
getting into bed with each other, rekindling their love. And we come to our finale. It's the final issue entitled The Hero's Life. And, oh, I thought it was going to go. So we're here at the finale entitled The Hero's Life. We've just found out that there are two tiny footsteps on Sue Dibney's brain. And that could have only come from one person. It had to have been the atom. So the reveal. Was it really the atom that could possibly have killed Sue? Why would he do it? Well, of course, it's yet another red herring in this Identity Crisis storyline. It was... Get ready, people. This is the big spoiler. If you haven't read it and you don't want to know, don't, don't go any further. It was... Of course, it was Jean. It was Jean all along. Um, and this has all been a mistake. She didn't mean to kill Sue. It was basically a means to an end to get them back together. Her estranged husband. And... It's at this point that Ray kind of makes a bit of a leap here that suddenly um, she, Jean, must be um, kind of insane to have done this and she gets basically locked up in Arkham. And of course everything goes back to normal uh, as much as it possibly can. The League, you know, there's characters in there that feel very uncomfortable being around others. Who knows what? I love this cover. Um, another great cover from Michael Turner. The, the kind of way that not only that the capes have been hung up in the sense that, you know, they're, it kind of, not so much, there is that kind of element of shame, the, the kind of cowl of Batman's head is, is headed down, all, all the kind of, all the capes and stuff, they all have this kind of downward lilt, like they've got their heads in shame uh, over what's happened. But there is kind of like this hanging up of their costumes. They're, they're no longer the heroes they used to be. Can they go on and move forward from this? Uh, which I think is just a, a great concept art um, style there from Michael Turner, very cleverly done. The epilogue of this finds our our Ray Palmer, who we haven't seen for quite some time, uh, basically dealing with um, not having his wife around with him and talking to her, talking to her as you do, um, to, to your dead wife. Many people have thought he was uh, going down the line of insanity himself here, but you know, he, he did get told by Green Arrow, you know, it helps to talk to her. You may not think she's there, but she, she always will be. And that's where, where this kind of mini-series, this big event from DC, ends in their run of crisis storylines. So overall, I actually really enjoyed this storyline, despite the kind of running controversy that went through it. The kind of out-of-character moments, those dark moments. The art... While it wasn't always the best Rag Morales' artwork that I've seen, it was pretty good and at least he managed to get this out on time every month, seven months in a row, which really can't be said for most event books these days. Um, the kind of plot holes and the kind of string, plot line strings that were left and not really addressed kind of irked me a little bit. The whole Bolt being mortally wounded, Firestorm dying, uh, the grey area with Superman's complicity in all these events, um, the fact that Ralph, despite being there at the start, didn't really get seen throughout the middle part of this storyline until right at the very end. Um, you would think even after finding out that Dr. Light wasn't the murder of his wife, he would still want to be very much part of the, the hunt to find the real killer. Um, but I'll kind of waver that a little bit. He was probably grieving somewhere in a corner. And <clears throat> throwing the threat to Lois Lane in there was a bit lame because that was really not addressed in the main book whatsoever. But ignoring all that, I did find it a really good murder mystery story. And I 
didn't know who it was right until the end. It was a big surprise and that's what I want from my murder mystery stories. I don't want to either know or be told who it is right from the very start. I want to learn. I want to find out as the story goes along. So, I hope you enjoyed that. There'll be more to come, not only from DC, but I'll be looking at Marvel as well. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to comment down there and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you all very much for watching and taking your time out of your daily life. Bye-bye.